Hello and welcome to another episode of the Don't Give a Ruck podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Parker, and I'm delighted to say that joining me on the show today is the former Harlequins and England number eight, Nick Easter, who will be helping me dissect England's performances in the Six Nations so far, as well as looking forward to all three matches this weekend. We also touched upon his time as a coach with Newcastle Falcons, and that is where we start right now, as I began by asking Nick whether he feels fortunate to still be involved in everyday sport in the middle of this vicious pandemic. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a rating on our iTunes page. Enjoy the show. Right, so firstly, Nick, um, I know it's been a tough time for everyone, uh, but I suppose you've been quite lucky in, in some respects that you've been involved in everyday sports since um, we've gone into the multiple lockdowns that we've been in. Yeah, well, certainly um, since I signed for Newcastle and started there at the end of August, yeah, I mean... I, I don't have to remind myself, but uh, I, I am well aware that, uh, you know, I'm sort of amongst all the other limitations as far as day-to-day -day job and collaborating with people outside your household and having face-to-face -face interactions and, you know, clearly obviously out on the training field as well, that uh, I find myself very fortunate to be able to carry on doing, you know, what I would do. Yeah, there's a few restrictions about, uh, you know, meetings and, you know, social distancing and face-to-face -face contact and what you can do on the field. Of course there is. Um, but it's not too far away to what it was like, you know, pre-COVID. And uh, I, I do count myself very lucky. What, what was it like at the start of lockdown? I know I've talked to a lot of players that have, have gone through it, but what was it like coming up to the training ground? Did you have to go in, in single cars and, and whatnot? Well, actually, this time last year, we went into lockdown. It's probably about a week away, isn't it? Mm. I was, uh, I'd returned from South Africa. So yeah. I wasn't coaching. I was in between and I was doing a consultancy work. And uh, so I was, you know, if you want, if you, if you want to put it um, in another way, sort of, you know, uh, you know, I was doing a sort of everyday job and uh, I was doing consultancy work and that all sort of dried up. Um, mm. So I found myself sort of throughout. April, May, June, you know, trying to find bits of work and bits and pieces while getting back into coaching. Um, but to answer your question, as far as coaching is concerned, yeah, there's been different stages. So when we returned um, at the end of August, we were in stage one training, which meant, you know, no, no sharing of cars from other households, um, you know, in you know, very small groups doing running, doing weights, gym area, only using one platform, making sure obviously everything was wiped down and sanitized. Um, and running sessions, and you could only you could only be at the club for, I think, a couple of hours a day. They didn't want you at the club for any longer than that. And then, you know, as testing took place, and you know, it progressed, um, yeah, you sort of never returned to normal, but you know, you still have measures in place. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about more about the Falcons later on in the show. Uh, but let's talk all things Six Nations on. That's what we've got you on here for your expertise. Um, let's start with England. You know, it's only one place to start. Um, last time out, of course, was a painful uh, 40, um, 20, 24 uh, defeat to Wales. Um, everyone's had plenty of time to sort of reflect on that game. Uh, what are your reflections on it? Well, my reflections are, and the concerning thing, is, I mean, well, one, posit positively, I thought England actually looked sharper ball in hand. They've looked for a long, long time. You know, it was pretty turgid stuff throughout the autumn. Um, last year, Six Nations wasn't, you know, it wasn't too fluid and they're sort of, they were close to rediscovering their World Cup 2019 form. And uh, so, that's, so that's a pleasing thing. The disappointing thing is they haven't learned the lessons of, you know, for a number of years now with experienced players there in, in terms of the discipline. And we won't get bogged down into, you know, a number of people have had their say as far as that's concerned. But, you know, with the leadership and discipline and the inability to sort of um, adapt um, when the game's going against you and sort of get back that momentum and, of course, adapt to the referee. Now, we won't go into certain decisions. I, don't, I think England would have lost the game anyway. Um, you know, we, we know it affects momentum. You've got the butterfly effect, of course. But um, that's something that England need to fix and fix sharp because we've had it in the past. 2018, you know, we lost six in a row there um, and it was a big issue. Um, was it ever fixed? I'm not so sure because you look at the games when England have been under pressure physically, when they haven't been able to get front football. Um, they've been stifled um, you know, on the game line, France last year in the Six Nations, Scotland this year in the Six Nations, Wales this year in the Six Nations, the World Cup final and Wales in 2019. If you look at those five games when sides haven't allowed England to bully them mm. um, and have actually, you know, frustrated them, 
they haven't managed to find another way to win, but also they haven't managed to be on the right side of the penalty count in all those games. And, you know, that's a concern over three, you know, three years, four seasons. Um, you know, I'm not sure if if they're going to be able to fix it. And you look at the amount of cats we got there, the amount of experience, and you, you shouldn't, you, you should be able, maybe not in one or two of those games, but in other games when you're unable to get your A game going, you should be good enough, experienced enough to be able to adapt, change what's going on, um, change tactics, change game plan, change your approach to the referee. Um, and, and that's still a concern for me. Mm. Uh, well, I don't know who's had more of the blame, Pascal Gauze or Eddie Jones over the last two weeks. Uh, as you said, everybody's had their opinion. Um, but do you think, I, I talked to George Shooter, one of your old former teammates, uh, two weeks ago, and he said, you know, it's not a World Cup year. Maybe it's time now for Eddie Jones to chuck some of the, well, not the youngsters, but the players are actually in form. That's what you would expect of uh, an international coach to pick players on form. Uh, you know, the likes of uh, Don Brandt and uh, Simmons at Exeter, who's tearing the premiership up. Um, do you believe that's the road Eddie Jones should go down, maybe if things don't go to plan on Saturday? I thought, well, we've just seen his selection, haven't we? And I, I'm quite disappointed, actually, because I think it is, is, is a road. I think his plan probably was beat Scotland, blood a few players, you know, you're a dog woos, uh, the Harry Randalls, the guys in the squad that are sort of new to the squad, possibly. You know, I'm com completely speculating here, but I guess against Italy. And then, uh, you know, th then you've, you've given those guys a taste of international rugby. But of course, you know, losing to Scotland, the plan's gone out the window. Um, but I think now after losing to Wales, no chance winning the Six Nations now. This is a great opportunity to try and create that depth in the squad. Um, look, a lot's been said about the Saracens players and whether they were match fit going into Scotland. Uh, we know what they can do, you know. I think this is a great opportunity, two years and what two and a half years in the next World Cup to create strength in depth um, in English rugby. A few of those guys there in the team, I think, are past it or over the hill. Certainly will be come to 2023. Um, some guys there have a wealth of caps and experience and actually probably going to peak around that time. Mm. And we're running out of games. And I think this is the perfect fixture. France are favourites, even though it's at Twickenham and they haven't won there since 2005 in, um, in the Six Nations. Um, there's no crowd there. This is a different French team. It's a French team on a high, um, very well-disciplined team. And I think I would have liked to have seen the form players, as you say, not the out-of-form players with a lot of caps, the form players, um, and maybe some guys drafted in like your Sam Simmons, like your Marcus Smiths, um, and, you know, told them to just give it a rip, see what you can do. This is international rugby and given these two games. I mean, France at home, uh, you know, the strongest team in the Six Nations, and then you've got Ireland away. Mm. Um, you know, those are two really, really good games to find a lot about your players. Mm. And it's strange how everything's been flipped on his head, hasn't it? Where, you know, you look back to uh, uh, back to the Autumn Nations Cup where England won pretty comfortably at the Park of Scarlets when they defeated Wales and Wales was sort of in transition and, and now it's almost been flipped on his head where all the pressure's on Eddie Jones and, and Wayne Pivak now in Wales is now the new messiah um, what, what have you made of Wales during the tournament have, have they been lucky as people have suggested well I'm a, I'm a straight talker yeah they have been lucky but you know what uh, you, well, you, you, make, you make your own luck they, they have been very very lucky they've played you know there's cynics out there will say right they played with 16 versus 15 against England 15 14 15 14 against the, in the previous two games Scotland and Ireland and I actually thought to be honest that uh, Ireland played better than Wales when they were down to 14 and so did Scotland <laughs> um, but it's an 80 minute game you've got to keep your discipline this day and age everyone knows the rules Wales are refereed the same way um, bar when they play England at Cardiff of course with a Frenchman <laughs> And well, that ill discipline's cost Scotland <laughs> and Ireland, doesn't it? And look, they found themselves in this position and make confidence. You, you, you can't manufacture confidence and momentum in sport. You can't. And winning habits and losing habits. It's, you know, if there was a secret formula to get out of a losing habit, you know, um, you know, get belief into a team, um, you, know, you, you would literally be a multi, multi-millionaire selling it. It's, it's so difficult and, with so little games in Tash Rugby, for them to now win three in a row, completely written off, really sort of given, I think most people had them second bottom, didn't they, um, mm -hmm. in their predictions. And yeah. I think it's great as a coach myself, Wayne Pivik, under pressure one year after, obviously a brilliant Gatland era, 
he was always going to be up against it, like anyone taking over from Sir Alex Ferguson at Man United, wasn't it? And uh, I'm really pleased for him because um, it is a results-based business. And however you get it, by hook or by crook, um, you know, they're three from three now. Um, will they get the Grand Slam? I don't think they've got enough um, to beat the French, to mm -hmm. be honest with you. Um, but Wales have shown, certainly in the Gatland era, that momentum is king. And they, and they usually finish the tournament a lot stronger than they start at Wales. Um, mm -hmm. And they've still got a lot of experience from that era to, to see it through. Mm. Well, apart from the referee, Wales had three real standout players on, on uh, last weekend against England. Um, Callum Sheedy, Lewis Rees Zamet and, and Tulupi Faletau. Um, what did you make of their performances? And Is it any coincidence that they, they play their rugby in England and that's developed them further? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm not so sure. I think, you know, exposure to all so sorts of leagues and styles and coaching um, is only going to benefit you as a player. And I think the most important thing is those guys were given an opportunity. I think what Wayne Pivock's done very bravely, and he had to, mm. is, he's, is, is he's blooded a lot of young talent. You know, Nick Tompkins, you know, Louis Rees Zamet. Mm. And as opposed to probably a lot of Northern Hemisphere coaches, is what you can't do. He's very much of the positive mindset. What, what can you do? We want you to do this. And with a, you know, a more expansive game plan as well, I think that that's, that's played into their hands. Look, they're missing three nines. Um, you know, who have always been big players for Wales and their quality nines that they were missing. So, um, you know, they've done very well in a lot of aspects. And in all fairness, even before the England game, if you looked at that Wales back row, you wouldn't be disappointed if that was the Lions back row. Mm. Um, yeah. And with the form they showed, and if they continue that form, we don't know where the Lions tour is going ahead. Let's just let's just pretend it is. Um, you know, that that's that's a very useful outfit. Mm. Well, the, the Island Italy game was pretty self-explanatory. We won't go into that one, but I want to get into the, the game that wasn't played, the Scotland France game. And, and again, lots of people have had their, their say on this one. Uh, Waffle Gate, uh, or whatever you want to put it, and Fabio Galte was was pretty irresponsible. Um, what, what did you make of the news that came out about that? And and did you believe Scotland should have been given the twenty eight nil victory? No, I don't think they should have, um, and I don't think they would want to. I know it's happening in league rugby and. It's slightly different over a long season and, and trying to cram a fixture in there. And it's just unfortunate. Um, but I think at the highest level, international rugby, um, with so much at stake, both both ends, then I don't think that should be the case. And uh, I think they should play it um, the week after the official Six Nation ends. And I know there's issues with releases. Um, I think yeah. the English clubs have said they'll be fine to release players. Um, not sure about the French, but uh, ultimately, you know, I know the French Union doesn't run the club game over there, but a successful French side and a French side playing and inspiring youngsters is only going to benefit the club game. And I think, you know, one one more weekend without your stars, you know, if, if they're on for a possible title or Grand Slam, would be well worth it in the long run as well. Mm. Let's bring it forward to this weekend now with uh, England obviously playing France. It's, it's a big game for both sides. Um, and I think when I talked to Bernard Leroux, the French uh, second row before the, the tournament started, as a Welshman, I didn't really see Wales coming anywhere, but I saw this game as, as the crunch game. I thought both sides would be going for the Grand Slam. Obviously, it's not like that. But who who's the game bigger for? Is it bigger for England or is it big for France? Oh, yeah, good good question. I, I think it's bigger for England. Mm. Um, you know, they're wounded, they're hurt. You know, I've been involved in England sides that are like that, and you pull out, you know, that bulldog spirit, if you like, and uh, you pull out a win. Um, they're at home. We've discussed, obviously, we know it's slightly different. Mm. Um, France haven't played for four weeks. England have played two weeks ago. Um, so they should be much more battle-hardened, match fit, um, you know, frothing at the mouth, ready to go at the French. And I'll be very interested to see how France go in this. Um, they have turned it around under Galtier and Sean Edwards and with these young guys that have won the, 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 the under-20s World Cup, you know, they're not scarred from previous losses and hammerings um, that's happened in the last decade of French rugby. Mm. And they're a confident side with world-class players. Let's not forget, they have world-class players. Seven, eight, nine, ten. I mean, that, that, that's serious business. But they haven't played for four weeks and they haven't been able to train for some of that as well. Mm. Um, England have. And as I said, they were actually sharper and in a lot of areas much better against Wales. And I think... You know, if I was Eddie Jones and they, they put the same team out, you know, this is it, boys. Um, whether it's last chance saloon for a few of them, I'm not so sure. But uh, let's hit the ground running in certain areas. Obviously, not the, the ones that didn't work out. 
let's hit the ground running like we did against Wales and, and see if they can live with us. Mm. And, and well, we never thought this year could get any stranger, but I think a lot of Welshmen and, and Welsh women will be sporting England on the weekend. And it's very strange to see that. But um, looking at the side, we, we mentioned it earlier, three changes, Max Malins, uh, Cowan Dickey and, um, and Charlie Ewers coming in. Um, what do you think? What, what do you think the thinking behind Eddie Jones's moves there, and how are they going to change the way England attack France? Um, I don't think I don't think it will change anything. I think Charlie Yields has been brought in for his line out prowess. Um, yeah, Johnny Hill's a bit more physical. Um, didn't have his best game against Wales, um, so Charlie Yields has been brought in for that. Um, Luke Cowan Dickey's been a standout hooker, I think, for a long, long time, and he's been given a shot. Um, he obviously feels that. There's not much between him and Jamie George and they're, they're very strong in that department. So Jamie can come on. He's a, he's a fantastic leader, Jamie George. He could, you know, in the sort of clutch moments in the last 20 minutes, he can come on, make good decisions and help with the leadership and steering at home, hopefully. Um, and Max Malings definitely deserves his chance. Yeah, Elliot Daly's had a pretty poor Six Nations. Um, not the only one, um, but he seems to have been made the scapegoat in a back line that uh, hasn't really functioned that well. Um but, uh, you know, his form's obviously dictated that uh, he deserves a shot at 15. Mm. And obviously you played uh, the majority of your career at, at eight in the back row. Uh, and obviously there's a, there's a great link between the eight, nine and ten. Um, what, what was your opinions on the, the Ford Farrell access? And would you have probably preferred Farrell to come in at ten and maybe have him a bit more of a ball carrier at the 12 position? Well, that, that, that's my concern for the game on the weekend is... Uh, you know, we've got a huge advantage in the fact that France haven't played in, for mm. four weeks and trained really properly in, in that time. But as I mentioned again, you look at Olivant, Aldrit, mm. Dupont, Jalibert as a spine of a team compared to the form, shall I say, not the class, the form of Vunapoli, Youngs, Ford, is it Ford, is it Farrell? Um, and, you know, there's a gulf in where they are from a form perspective at the moment and I, I go back to what we said earlier in the show you know if he had blooded a little bit more whether it be Ben Earl at eight Sam Sims at eight whoever and Harry Randall coming in at nine then you know you create that depth in that position which is only going to raise the standards it's, you know it's harder to get out of the team and in the team and if that, that's the case you're not really driving that competition where you're looking over your shoulder all the time and you know, that extra 5% in performance can be the difference. Um, and, I, and I think for some of those guys, this, you know, this is a big game for them. This really is a big game for them because I think if, if England lose this or, they don't, or they, you know, those guys don't perform and they win, there's going to be some serious questions asked. And England, I think, have conceded, I think it's something like seven tries in the, in the first three games. Um Usually a team that goes on to win the, the tournament usually averages about three three or four tries in the whole tournament. Um, and there's an Englishman in, in the opposite camp in France, in Sean Edwards. Um, do you think England missed the trick in not trying to break the bank and, and getting him over to the England side? I think they've done that many a time. I think back in 2008, after the Seven World Cup, they missed a trick. Sean Edwards said that he wanted... I think... <sighs> Better fact check me, but I'm pretty sure Sean Edwards uh, wanted to still coach Wasps. And yeah. he said it's too much of a conflict and you need to be full-time. So they offered him the Saxons. He said, no, I'll, I'll coach Wasps. I'm not sure if he was approached another time, um, but a certain opportunity. This... Look, John Mitchell's a very, very good coach. And actually, if you look at the England defence, I know you're saying they've conceded seven tries, but it's actually been their super strength of, of, of the last couple of years. I mean, there's been some real aggression. You know, he, As soon as he came in, if you remember England in 2018... You know, they, they lost those three games in the Six Nations. They got hammered by South Africa twice. Um, Barbars put 60 on them. You know, they were pretty porous there. And John Mitchell came in and gave a lot more aggression, a lot more in-your-face in sort of, you know, will dictate, not the attack um, mm -hmm. type of defence. And, uh, you know, we saw in the autumn series when they played Ireland and all they did was defend second half. And it was like a training run. It was like, right, you can have the ball in our half, but we're just going to keep you out. And... You know, I think you look at two tries that Wales have scored. You look at the try right at the end. You know, in any other circumstances, would they have been a scored? We're not so sure. And um, I don't think that's an issue for England. Um, but to answer your question, um, you know, should could they have got Sean Edwards on in the past, in the last 12 years since he's been available? A hundred percent.
a hundred percent. And I think Sean deep down would love to coach England as well. Mm. Well, we talked about Wales and Wayne Pivak earlier, but I think at the minute, probably the man at the, the centre of everything and, and has been at the centre of everything for the last, I'd probably say about 15, 15, 16 years is Alan Wynne Jones. Um, you must have come up against him many times. Um, how good is he? I thought you were going to say Paul Stridgen. <laughs> you know, it. Bobby. Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby Boucher. He's been a big part of that as well, and he's great for uh, morale. No, Alan Wynne Jones, look, I've played against him, uh, you know, many a time back in the day. Um, what what an athlete, what a pro. You speak to Sean Edwards, Sean Edwards said he's the best athlete mm. he's ever coached. And, you know, and he's coached a lot of world class mm. players and athletes. He said he's the best athlete he's ever coached. And I think that, that that goes a long way towards not, not only obviously his gifts in terms of that department, but his professionalism. You hear about his leadership. His humility as well and and how he embraces the guys that come into the squad and wants to get to actually know them, not necessarily talk rugby and talk shop, but actually get to know their background, their family. And you can see on the field as well. I mean, I've never been captain. I've never played in the same team as him or be captain by him, but you can see that calm influence he has mm. on the group. And, you know, myself included, I suppose, after the World Cup, I think some of us thought he was... Uh, you know, in his twilight years on, on on the slide, actually, last year. But he certainly, with a bit of a break and a bit of a rest and a reset, um, and his, uh, you know, his ability as an athlete, as Sean says as well, to look after himself, even at the ripe old age that he is, um, to rediscovering that form and his mojo. And I think as well, you know, coming out from the Welsh camp, you know, the players have taken on a big leadership role. Um, it's been very driven by the players. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of the standards, how they want to play, what suits them, um, how they want to approach the game, the training week and everything. And I'd imagine he had a big say in that as well. Mm. And finally, on Sunday, Scotland, obviously, play Ireland. And and, you're, and again, another former teammate of yours, Andy Farrell, um, in some quarters is under pressure from the from the Ireland faithful. Um, what have we made of his time as an Ireland coach? And, you know, when you played with him, did you see him as a coach in the future? Oh, God, yeah, 100%. He was uh, my debut. He made his debut the week before and my debut, and he was calling the shots. You know, yeah. Johnny was asking him for advice. He was calling the shots. And he was, he, you know, there's loud people. There's guys with big voices. Um, and sometimes they don't always front up. Um, but but Faz also kept it simple. It was very simple what he was asking. It was reasoned. Um, and it was, yeah, there was no question that he would go into coaching at all. Mm-hmm. Um, his time with Ireland, yeah, look, it's... I th- I think it was par last year from, you know, reports. I think they won three three of the Six Nations games. Mm. But I said before the tournament, you know, Wales, I, I said about Wales, Scotland and uh, and Ireland, they need to beat, they need to beat one of England and France for the Six Nations mm. now. Now, Scotland are beating England, Wales are beating England um, and Scotland, well, well, England um, and Ireland... You know they 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 need to beat England. I think on that last that last game, um, you know they got they obviously got Wales who are a bit more favoured now. But uh, I th- I think he he is under pressure. He's got a tough two games coming up. I think the issue they've had is ball in hand. Mm. Um, you sort of watch the game. I was watching against France. I was thinking, you know, how are you trying to score tries here? You know, it seemed to be a lot of Gary Owens, the old school Gary Owen up and under, and uh, they seem to run out of ideas pretty much and. That they've gone away massively from the Joe Schmidt, very prescribed, know your role, be in exactly this place for exactly this ruck. Mm. Um, and whoever slots in there, the hole will always be there. You'll create the momentum for the next phase, whatever it might be. Um, they've gone away from much more of a freedom of thinking and heads up. Um, but you've got to also have the cattle and the players to be able to do that and take advantage of those opportunities like a DuPont for France. Um, and they need to start showing a lot more cutting edge an incision in attack and hopefully, you know, from their point of view, that, that result in tries on the scoreboard because that's where they're really struggling. Mm. And, stick, and sticking with coaching, Nick, um, I, I've, I've had, I think this is something like the 34th or the 35th uh, show that I've had on the podcast and I'd probably say about half of the players past and present have said they don't really want to get into coaching. They, they, they sort of, they're done with the game. I, I don't know whether that's due to knocks or, or, um, or head injuries or whatnot. But did you always see yourself as a coach? I started, um, 
I mean, I, I taught before I coached, you know, I, I, I did a bit of teaching um, abroad um, and I always enjoy giving back. I enjoyed, you know, helping people try and realize their potential. It doesn't always work, um, but uh, you get a real kick out of that. Or I got a real kick out of that. And then, yeah, did a little bit for my old boys when, you know, I was starting at Harlequins, then, then just concentrated on my career and other sort of interests of mine and you know towards the last three years Harlequins coached you know another local side um up the divisions and decided you know this is the path I want to go you know I just enjoy being you know rugby clubs a great environment to work in you know we spoke about it earlier you know being lucky enough to still do it you know the banter the crack the fact that everyone is motivated towards the same goal whether it be the doctor whether it be the junior physio um let alone the players and the and a, a, analysts or what have you is Everyone's motivated towards the team, one team winning for a start, but you know also performing and playing a good brand of rugby. And uh, you know, along with that, from a coaching perspective, it's about making those players better ultimately. Um, and then, the, and then the collective comes in, and I really enjoy it. You know, there is pressure with it, but I enjoy the pressure. I love the I love the fact there's a game every week. My God, you know, for a period last year when there wasn't something to look forward to at the weekend, and as we all knew when there was no sport for a while, that uh, there was something glaringly missing for sport, sports lovers or rugby lovers in our lives. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's great being part of a contest. It's not the same as playing. It's nowhere near as good as playing. I knew that. I've had my time. It's these youngsters' time now. I'll just, I just want to be there to help make it the best time, you know, of their lives or make the best of their careers, so to speak. And, uh, you know, so far I've had, you know, three different clubs professionally. So picked up a lot of knowledge, a lot of IP and, you know, starting to understand, you know, where I want to come from um, for, for in my areas. And I thoroughly enjoy it, mate. I thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, and what was your time like in, uh, well, in South Africa with the Sharks? Different from up here. I mean, uh, it was 24 degrees minimum throughout the entire season there. Um, did get up to a horrible 38, 40 with the... Uh, you know, near 100% humidity at times. But uh, I was never out of shorts and a T-shirt. Um, lived in a place right on the beach. I took up a bit of surfing. Um, we were in early at around 5.30, 6 o'clock, so sunrise on the East Coast there. Here, probably a little bit different. It's dark, dark for a little bit longer. Dark a lot earlier in the afternoons. A lot colder. Um, but... Uh, I'm absolutely loving it up here. I mean, there's some real, real gems in the Northumbria sort of countryside and everything and lovely, lovely quaint villages as well as, you know, Newcastle city centre around that area, which has obviously been shut down or on lockdown since I've been here. But uh, when it comes out of lockdown, that's going to be the party place to be. Um, but my parting days are done now, but uh, I might pop my head in for one or two. Uh, but yeah, I'm absolutely loving it. And they're a great group of lads. You know, I'm working with my old boss, Harlequins, Dean Richards, who's a terrific boss. He completely gets it. He um, He's not a micromanager by any means. He, he backs you. Um, he'll challenge you at the same time. And, uh, you know, he's a wily old dog um, or old bull. Um, and, and he's great to sort of pick the brains of as well, along with the other coaches. And, uh you know, they've got a real identity up here as well in the northeast, which I think helps. And uh, the, the boys are great. So coachable, great attitude. Um, and, you know, thoroughly enjoying it so far. Just, mm. just need the crowds back, really. Yeah. Need the people to come and enjoy it as well. Well, Nick, before you go, is it okay if we finish with a quick fire round? Yeah. Go ahead, mate. Go ahead. Brilliant. Uh, so, firstly, who's the best player you played with? Played with, uh, let's go with Jason Robinson. Uh, best player you've come up against? Let's go with Juan Smith, the South African uh, blind side. Brilliant. Uh, best friend in rugby? Best friend in rugby would have to be, let's go with a good mate of mine who's my best man, Alex Bennett. Uh, your favourite coach? My favourite coach would, oh, it's got to be my boss, isn't it? Dino. <laughs> uh, best man. I've got to say that. I've got to say that. He employs <laughs> yeah. me. Contracts um, up next year. <laughs> best match you've been involved in as a player oh a couple um i'll have to say the prem prem final in 2012 was just magnificent um you know f from a club point of view you know playing a final at twickenham you know walking across having a guard of honor from our home a home um ground at the stoop and I suppose internationally, it'd have to be the quarterfinal in Marseille against Australia when we were completely written off in 2007. 
Yeah. Um, we went down there. There was just a sea of white in the velodrome, and it was a baking hot day at three three o'clock kickoff mm. in the afternoon. The French beat the All Blacks uh, later on that evening. It was one hell of a day, and uh, you know, a hell of a night as well. Yeah, George Shorter said you were in a you were in a pub somewhere in France after the game, and you were cheering with the French supporters. But we were sponsored by O2, and they had a couple of boats. A couple of yachts just moored up in the harbour and the French support. There's probably about 3,000 watching a massive screen mm. in the uh, Marseille um, you know, harbour. And uh, we had enjoyed hospitality on the boat. And every time you know, France scored, I think a couple of tries the second half, we ran out, ran off the boat into the crowd and started cheering with them. Yeah, And then mm. back on the boat for a bit more... Uh, bit more booze and um, entertainment and then back out again whenever the French were scoring or made a turnover or kicked a penalty, whatever it might be. Well, well I thought you were going to say the four tries you scored against Wales, the 60 points, but I'm glad you didn't say that. Um, nah, mate, that, mate, that, that that's easy, that is. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's not really an achievement. <laughs> against that Welsh side, anyway, it was easy. No, no, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, worst drinker you played with? Worst drinker? Yeah. <sighs> Mike Brown, probably. <laughs> Uh, biggest troublemaker on and off the field? Biggest troublemaker, old Danny Kerr. Is it? So it was a small... Yeah, well, the thing is, that Dan, D- D- Danny Kerr is one of those classic little guys, hangs around the big guys and goes and starts st- starts a bit of trouble, um, whatever it might be, a bit of mischief, and then, uh, you know, goads them and, you know, he's shouting from the cheap seats, but then, uh, you know, he ducks behind you and uh, gets the big lads to sort everything out for him. And w- whether it's obviously through diplomacy or whether... You know, intimidation. Um, you're always having to clear up his uh, his misbehaviour after he's had a few. Well, I suppose you've got a speed to run off, haven't you? Um, finally, if he you weren't a rugby, yeah, yeah. Uh, finally, if you weren't a rugby player, what would have been your dream job? Lead singer, lead guitarist of a very successful band. What would the band I've name got be? No music. I've got no musical talent at all, <laughs> um, which is why it was never even a possible. But you did say a dream job. <laughs> Uh, well, I think George Shooter said astronaut, so uh, I think it went up on him. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, that's just dull, mate. It's like saying you want to be in a submarine, you know, in confined, confined places, no one near you, close <laughs> to death. I don't understand that, but he's a right weirdo, George. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, Nick, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, mate. It's, uh, it's been a good laugh. I know we've been... Uh, quite quick but um all the best for saturday with the, the falcons is a it's an early kickoff if ever, anybody wants to go and watch that um, and for the rest of the season and hopefully uh england victory on saturday yep yep let's hope so mate let's hope so